All right, good morning and welcome to PAC's MedTech series on demystifying ambulatory surgery centers. I'm Dean Miller, the president and CEO of PAC, and I wanna welcome you this morning to this event. Um, you know, certainly for those of you who attended our, our uh, capital conference last week where we had about 500 folks in person, an exciting event. By the way, a med tech company did get funding in the lion's end, spoiler alert there. Um, we couldn't do what we do without the support of some great organizations. And I want to thank our sponsors, Baker Tilly, Dwayne Morris, Fox Rothschild, and the Penn Center for Innovation. We are on a new platform, Run the World, and we're excited to utilize this platform. Um, and uh, just keep a note that everyone will be on mute and off camera. We will go at 9.35 right into networking tables, uh, small round tables, subject-based, where you can connect with speakers uh, and, other, and other participants on a face-to-face -face basis. Uh, again, excited to use this platform and the seamless ability to move from this production right into uh, uh, to some networking. Without further ado, uh, let me introduce our moderator for the day. Uh, Dr. Katie Ruther is the executive director of the Penn Health Tech, the Center for Health Devices and Technology. And for those of you who don't know, she'll share a little bit more. This is a relatively new organization that's a collaborative effort all around med tech, bringing together engineering and medicine, as well as Wharton and other entities within the Penn ecosystem to help drive commercialization within the med tech se sector. We're excited to have uh, Katie join us this morning, who did her graduate work at Penn and is now returned as the executive director. Welcome, Katie. Thanks so much, Dean, for having me. So uh, as Dean mentioned, I'm the new executive director for Penn Health Tech, which is a university-wide effort at Penn to advance some of the world-class discoveries and breakthroughs in medical devices and health technology um, with the potential to hopefully benefit human health and society. And so in short, we fund and support early stage innovators and startups who are working to develop and commercialize novel health technologies. So I'm really delighted to moderate today's panel on the topic of demystifying the ambulatory surgery center. I'm gonna start by kind of setting the stage and then we'll hear some brief introductions from our panelists. Um, as Dean mentioned, we'll have a panel discussion for about an hour and then we'll have the opportunity to break out and do some topic-based networking with our panelists. And so we'll welcome questions from the chat throughout and hopefully we'll get to them during the panel discussion, but if not, we'll be able to revisit those in the breakout sessions. So just kind of setting the stage a little bit here, many of us know that ambulatory surgery centers are outpatient facilities that are providing same-day surgical care without the need for hospital admission and thus making them more affordable and convenient. And so in the past, almost all surgical procedures were performed in hospitals, but we've seen a lot of advancements in technology that has really allowed many of these procedures to be performed safely and effectively in an outpatient setting. So today there's over 6,000 medical Medicare certified ambulatory surgical centers nationwide and more than 23 million procedures are performed in these centers annually. These procedures range from endoscopy to ophthalmology to orthopedics and cardiovascular. Um, and so in addition to transforming healthcare delivery, um, we've also seen that ASCs are kind of transforming the market for medical devices, health technologies, as well as equipment. And so as these outpatient surgery centers centers are um, beginning to perform more of a growing share of these procedures, med tech innovators and leaders are really starting to rethink some of their commercial stat strategies. And so in today's panel, we have a number of questions that we're going to be trying to address and that need answers. And so we're intending to provide them today. So we're going to jump into it. Um, and I'd like to start with sort of um, each of the panelists to provide some of their personal background, as well as their experience and connection to ambulatory surgical center. So let's start with Robert Edelstein. Uh, good morning. Uh, I founded and ran uh, two surgical instrument companies uh, focused on selling specialty surgical instruments. Uh, when we got started back in the early 90s, there was about 200 surgery centers. And uh, through the course of, of the years, they grew, as Katie said, to about 600, uh, really focused on the uh, selling and uh, innovation marketing uh, into those facilities 
and also helped uh, about 300 de novo facilities get equipped uh, with all the surgical instrumentation they needed for the various procedures. All right, thanks, Robert. How about Bob? Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, I uh, My involvement in the surgery center space uh, dates back to the 90s, um, but prior to that, I was a hospital administrator, and including a hospital chief executive, uh, and uh, I also spent some years doing turnarounds for uh, Merrill Lynch and their investment banking group. Um, but I, in the 90s, I did a lot of financing of surgery centers, primarily, uh, and probably did about 150 surgery centers around the country. Uh, obviously, a good portion of, of the financing we did w was related to equipment of various and sundry kinds, and different purchasing methodologies were used. Some of it was just straight leasing, and some of it was razor, razor blade, and that sort of thing. Um, and uh, subsequent to 90s, I've had a consulting business, uh, and I've developed surgery centers. Uh, I've not run any specifically, uh, but I've developed a few of them, and I've been an owner in a surgery center as well. Um, and I'm happy to be here today to answer questions. I'm specifically focused on the role of, of physicians and how it, the incredible important part they play in the success of surgery centers. Okay, thanks, Bob. Um, how about Mark? Hey, thanks for having us. Um, I'm Mark Foster, I'm currently the CEO and president of Trice Medical, which is a uh, local based uh, healthcare company. Uh, we make uh, a significant amount of products that are used today at surgery centers. Prior to coming to Trice, I uh, led an orthopedic company called Smith and Nephew. Um, and was at Boston Scientific for another eight, uh, eight years as well. Both of those roles were in a commercial function where we um, created products and programs to, to take advantage of the surgery center environment, as well as created and designed some sales channels uh, that are specific to, uh, to focus on those markets. So uh, thanks for having me today. Thanks, Mark. And then finally, last but not least, Scott Freezer. Thanks. Um just by way of introduction, I have been in the medtech ecosystem for about 26 or so years. Um, started off at Boston Scientific and, and was colleagues with Mark during a tremendous growth phase of um, GI endoscopy ambulatory centers, which was late 90s, early 2000s. Um, since that time, part of two successful startups. Um, one was an Israeli startup that sold to Covidian, then sold to Medtronic. Um, respectively. And then uh, most recently was part of the, the founding executive team, a company called EndoChoice, which sold to Boston Scientific in 2016. Um, one of the main reasons why Boston Scientific purchased Endo's Choice um, after becoming a public company was um, we cracked the nut, so to speak, on ambulatory centers. Uh, we built a business of about $85 million in annual revenue um, all focused on ambulatory centers uh, in the GI endoscopy space. And since that time, I have been working um, kind of on the other side of the fence uh, with private equity sponsors that are investing in ambulatory centers. Um, first was a consultant and then an executive with a local company here called Physicians Endoscopy, which is owned by a private equity firm and has 65 or so ambulatory centers uh, nationwide. And then most recently with a private equity sponsor called HIG Capital, which uh, was responsible for scaling and really the creation of surgery partners, taking surgery partners from about 10 centers to 150 or so centers when public and now owned by Bain Capital. Um, I work with a number of large med tech clients on consulting for surgery center strategy and uh, looking forward to the panel discussion. Okay, thanks everybody for those introductions. So wanted to start kind of by setting the stage here. We've seen a lot of things moving over to the ambulatory surgery center market. There's been a huge increase in procedures that are falling outside of hospitals. And so I wanted to start a little bit with the history of this and uh, what trends you might have seen over the past five years that are going to be really critical for med tech companies to consider. And so maybe Robert Edelstein, you could start um, with that question. Robert, you're on mute. Um, hi. The, the, uh, initially, the surgery center started with a very core group of specialties like endoscopy or ophthalmology, 
Uh, as the centers grew, they really expanded into most of the other specialties. Uh, really since about 2010, uh, a lot more complex procedures moved there, including uh, hip and knee replacement procedures. Um, these procedures have uh, gotten less evasive over time and faster, easier to do in the surgery centers. So that's been a big change. Uh, and also uh, spine procedures, uh, sometimes even more complex uh, spine, but uh, minimally evasive spine uh, laminectomies have moved there. And really one of the trends that, that we see uh, is, you know, really the 80-20 rule, uh, especially post-COVID, has played out that the the centers with the stronger core group of surgeons who drive more volume and the surgery centers that are better managed and doing a better job marketing, getting contracts are really winning the lion's share of procedures. And you're finding that uh, those are, if you can get in there, those are the best to sell to because the the volumes that they're providing or doing in the in the surgery centers are really significant. So you might come across one that's doing uh, one or two spines a month, and the next one might be doing 40 or 50 spine a month. So it's really important to find the, the 80-20 rule and find the, the 20% are doing the most of the procedures right now. There's a lot of consolidation going on. Thanks, Robert. And Bob Goodman, do you have anything to add to that in terms of what you've been seeing? Uh, yeah, I, Robert's right that there's been a lot of change. Um, I've seen change since... I got involved with surgery centers in the early 90s, and there's been a tremendous amount of growth and a tremendous amount of change. One of the big things uh, associated with the dynamics of surgery centers is the role of, of the physician. And uh, many physicians are partners in surgery centers uh, and, and users, and they have to be users. There's a, there's a legal tie-in between those two things. You can't just be an investor and not use the surgery center. There are a lot of surgery centers that also just have folks that are that are just users, which is a, a good thing as well. Um, they can often be very, very profitable, especially those that are um, tend to be out of network from a, a reimbursement standpoint. And uh, those are those are uh, those are pretty good, too. They're also a big dynamic that's changed over the years is early on. Hospitals weren't really interested in participating in surgery centers as, as equity partners. And that has dramatically changed. They have they have seen the value, financially speaking, of, of that um, locally here in the Delaware Valley. A best example of that, or one of the best examples anyway, uh, is the Virtua Health System. They have ownership interest in, I don't know, 25, 30 surgery centers. And it's a uh, the, the 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 profit from those centers, the cash flow from those centers represents a significant part of uh, of their bottom line, quite frankly. Yeah, great. Thanks for setting the stage for us and some of the history there. Um, you know, many people in the audience are kind of uh, med tech innovators or working in startups or, uh, or a little bit more established companies. And so I wanted to shift a little bit to think about how uh, how you might consider developing products specifically for the ambulatory surgery center mar center market. I know Mark and Scott have some experience there. So, Mark, can you share a little bit about your experience with that? Sure. So first of all, you can't you can't be blind to the realities of, of the economic discussion. So um, you can't put your head in the sand and, and not appreciate how different the lens is for a surgery center that, than a hospital. Um, so like always, product development starts with listening to the customer. You have to understand that that's a different market. So in your focus groups, you've got to include that as a, as a separate segment of your product development process and not just blend the surgery center feedback into everything else. <clears throat> so for, for us, we've done a couple things. Um, it really depends on your product and how cl clinically differentiated it is. If you've got something that's clinically differentiated, you can focus on the different user experience in the surgery centers, uh, understand that they're oftentimes more capital constrained. Um, and then a lot of times, uh, just repackaging your existing products in a different way can make a big difference. For example, when we were at Boston Scientific, we actually had a surgery center uh, approach, if you will. It was, its own, it was almost a marketing tool as much as it was a product in that the, uh, the, uh, the presentation of the product was aligned in a way. Uh, we actually took some products that were in our catalog but were less focused on in the hospital and created a surgery center specific um, uh, portfolio that really made that customer think that we were differentiated. 
We had different pricing programs in that market, uh, uh, meaning we had cost per procedures so that every procedure could be built in a certain way as opposed to expecting to get a heavy uh, piece of capital equipment. Uh, those decision makers have uh, the good part about that environment is they're usually a little quicker to be able to kind of get new products into there. Um, so, you know, I would think about the, the product, uh, make sure you're involving the surgery centers in the development process. And for existing products, uh, just understand you might be able to tackle that market even in just repackaging or repositioning your existing portfolio. That's some great advice. Thanks, Mark. And how about you, Scott? Anything else to add there in terms of developing products for this specific yeah, I, I, I really appreciate Mark's comments um, because I think far too many med tech companies um, and, and some of the biggest med tech companies really have a historical bias about um, surgery centers, thinking that they are cheap, um, they are only focused on cost and bottom line. And that is very true, but I would argue they're business owners. And they think like business owners. And it, it, that's an important lens um, for med tech innovators to appreciate is they think very much like you think. Um, they're looking at KPIs. They're measuring the financial performance of their centers weekly, daily. They have monthly board packets. They have monthly governance meetings. Um, so if you take that lens when you're approaching the surgery center market, it helps ground you in the perspective of an owner. Um, and the other thing that they are now, there's heavy influence on is a number of the large ASC management companies, as well as individual ambulatory centers are owned by private equity firms. And they're now armed with not only um, billions of dollars and dry powder to invest in expanding their networks, but they're also armed with very, very sophisticated analytical skills um, at the private equity firm. And they're now looking at utilization of certain products. They're looking at, you know, the biggest spend items. And obviously labor is, is one. But what I would suggest for the, the folks on this call and just med tech clients in general is what is your product doing, product or service doing to impact the KPIs of an ambulatory center? Um, that is very much equal weighting to how is your product or service differentiating clinical care and, and clinical delivery of, of uh, what that surgery center is doing. So it's, it's a very different perspective. And I think for med tech clients that have essentially cracked the nut, if you will, and surgery centers, they very much have thrown out that historical bias and are focused on what is my product or service doing to help this ambulatory center achieve their, you know, their financial success. And it isn't always just the lowest price. Um, right now with the labor market shortage, and I, I was on a call earlier this week talking about how much ambulatory staffing um, costs have gone up in the past you know, few months. It's astronomical. I mean, you're, you're looking at schedulers, techs, you know, kind of the lowest um, paid workers in ambulatory centers now are, are demanding 20 to 30% raises to to stay at their job or to show up for their job. So, um, you know, what can your product or service do in regards to labor? So interesting. Yeah, and these are all a really important point and glad our audience can hear from, from you guys about this. Um, wanted to shift a little bit, you know, as we think about developing, we also think about how we might sell into these markets. And so I um, wanted to ask, you know, how do you see med tech companies specifically particularly being able to sell into these markets? And are, are there maybe innovative business models you've seen that are particularly effective for the ambulatory surgery center market? So maybe Bob Goodman, can we start with you on that? Bob, you're on mute. Yeah, I know. Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, as, as you look at the market, the surgery center market and, and who you're trying to sell into, um, I think the, the comments that, that Scott made a few moments ago uh, about being sensitive to uh, their cost structures and, and their, their own level of profitability, I think, is, it clearly is, is key. Um, I also think that uh, a way to get in, a way to, to, uh, to appeal to the surgery center spaces is rarely with the physicians and, and knowing what, 
how they practice what they what they do, how they what what kind of procedures they do, what innovations do they see that are possible, uh, and and listen listen to them, and whether that's in focus groups or one on one situations as you're working with physicians. I'm not sure. It, I, it probably does matter to some degree, um, especially to uh, gain some consensus about about changes. But I think those are that's important. I also think sensitivity towards uh, reimbursement um, is is key. And whether it's it's uh, because the center is doing things that are out of network uh, or or not doesn't really matter. A lot of instances, uh, you know, that that out, out of network window is closing uh, has closed in some cases uh, and. So what you're looking at, from my perspective, is you're is you're looking at um, is there is there a way to uh, ensure that whatever new innovation you've got uh, is going to be something that's going to be reimbursed and perhaps additive to the surgery center itself, um, f- financially speaking. Um, so, uh, and I can talk more about physicians, and I can do that later in the in the in the uh, roundtables, but. Yeah, and you know that that's huge what you mentioned about the reimbursement and definitely you know reimbursement at a lower rate in the ambulatory surgery center. So consideration for that early on for innovators is really critical. Um, Bob uh, or Robert Edelstein, do you have any uh, additional comments on that? Well, just generally in, in selling into the surgery centers, I think you know as as any uh, business these days, marketing is is really important. Uh, really looking at like an inbound marketing program where. You're creating the right selling proposition and the right why are, are we the company that the surgery center wants to use, um, spending a, a good amount of time on making sure the messaging on the website is aligned to both uh, what you offer and, and how you can help the facilities uh, getting uh, your SEO and, and content out there. So when uh, the nurses are, are searching for something, which they often do, um, they're coming across across your site. Uh, the, the group purchasing organizations uh, obviously have tried to uh, make headway in the surgery centers. Uh, my business, uh, Millennium Surgical, never had any GPO contracts, uh, and we use that as a benefit, not as a, as a obstacle. So uh, if that's all, obviously going to be one of the first objections that the uh, nurse is going to throw at you. You know, are you on our GPO? And what we always did is really tried to find the products that weren't covered under the GPO or not covered covered under the GPO right and really uh, niche our way in. So as the surgery centers are a niche in the market, uh, the companies really need to find the right niche within the surgery centers. Great, great. So a little bit more about on the on the selling side and kind of continuing that line of thought. Um, what are some? What are you feel like the biggest challenges are for med tech companies that are are that they must overcome in order to maybe sell into this market? Um, and kind of going to go with Scott on this one to see if you have it. Yeah, what, I'd say the biggest challenges um, are legacy um, selling methods. If I, if I think about um, you know how medtech has historically gone to market and commercialized products, it's focusing on you know different disease states and what's the standard of care and how does your widget um, you know impact you know clinical care, which we can't lose sight of. But the added um, dynamic in a surgery center is what is your product or service doing to that surgery center's business. And where there's synergies is when you have a superior, you know, product in terms of clinical delivery or clinical outcome with a product or service that is also making money for that surgery center. And as as I commented earlier, it's not always the cheapest product. Um, If I look at you know, Mark's portfolio of Trice Medical and, and what they're doing, I think is a great example, is they're removing the, the laparoscope from traditional procedures. Um, and there's a cost to that, but the lower complication rate and, you know, the ability to get a quick diagnosis, I think, is, is phenomenal and, and on the right side of healthcare. The other thing that I would, would suggest when you're thinking about surgery center strategy or commercialization strategy is this market is growing dramatically. And one of the things, and, and 
there's a lot being now published on this, and I, I speak on this a number of t- in a number of forums, is that convergence of CMS coverage, which we now have total joints and cardio cath procedures, which are complex hospital-based, traditional hospital-based procedures that now have coverage in with CPT codes, coupled with private payers also establishing sync coverage, and then the a massive amount of private equity funding in this space. Um, it, it's like a perfect storm and you add COVID on top of that. Um, and the physicians don't wanna be in the hospitals. The patients certainly don't wanna be in the hospitals. ASCs are COVID free by design. Hospitals are COVID positive by design. So there's, there's massive you know, market forces that are activating this surgery center market. And in a world of price transparency, um, you look at the cost of a, you know, a, a, not to pick on Penn, but, you know, if I'm going for an endoscopy at Penn and they have a wonderful gastroenterology department, it costs about three times the cost of having the procedure done with the same equipment and, you know, comparable physicians on the main line. And that's on the right side of healthcare. If, if you think how we're going to take costs out of, out of the system. And as I think more price transparency appears and patients get more educated of what their, you know, out of pocket, out of network costs are going to be, there's going to be a natural selection process um, to ambulatory centers. Yeah, all great points. And you you mentioned Trice Medical, so I might kick it over to to Mark here and, you know, share a little bit about your experience and maybe challenges that you face in terms of trying to sell into this. Mark, uh, you're The sentence of 2021. You're yeah, we got that out a couple. Yes, we, we, we got there. So I think Scott's right about uh, two main things I was going to talk about. One is uh, his talk about the, the, the legacy selling issues. Uh, you've got to think about it through the ASC's lens. So, for example, if your company is set up in a way that has uh, your structure, but yet the surgery center, for example, doesn't view their life in your organizational structure. Orthopedics is a classic example of that, and that a surgery center might only do small bone, what's called cold fracture procedures or or arthroscopy cases. So they look at their world and say, these are the the 20 cases we do of your portfolio, but your company might be set up uh, in, in a different way. So that surgery center might actually want one sales rep for the 10 procedures that they do and they don't care that that's actually 10 different sales reps in, in your organization. So you have to figure that out. Um, the other thing, uh, you know, you have to manage your, your average selling price. And it's a real challenge. And again, I just say you can't be blind. So there's a couple things that happen. One is, you know, a real life example is, uh, again, on the orthopedic side, uh, there's what's called implants. So you're, you're going to use a shoulder anchor. You will have physicians say, I'll use the $700 biocomposite anchor in the hospital, in the surgery center. I want the $200 metal anchor. And, and to be quite honest, that's actually, it's not, it's not really compliant. It's certainly not, not good medicine, uh, but it's, it's the reality. So you have to find a way to, to understand that there are potential compliance issues with, with your sales organizations in addition to the business related uh, challenges of selling uh, things at a lower price in that market. So again, things you just can't put your head in the sand about. You have to understand, um, you know, how to look through their lens. Yeah, all really great tips and advice. Uh, so I wanted to ask the the question here for, for the folks that have experience. How, how do you get to the end user uh, or how do med tech companies get to the end user here? What, what has been your experience and, and recommendations for folks that are developing products for this, this market? So Robert Edelstein, can you give us some? Yeah, the, the good news for the startups or the, the new companies is that, uh, from my experience, the, the larger, more established players in each sub-market selling into the surgery centers really you know, came in late to selling into the surgery centers. They don't have a dedicated sales force often, and they're not, you know, in my opinion, really good at the value proposition for the surgery center. So it creates a nice opportunity for the younger startup companies. Um, you know, it's pretty easy to find a list of the surgery centers, uh, you know, and the list that we used to have included the specialty breakdowns. 
and even the volumes for the service center. So you can very easily uh, buy that list, import that into your CRM, sort that list and, and really find the centers that you want to target. Um, we did all direct uh, inside selling. So we started uh, inside sales into surgery centers back in the 90s and never, you know, meeting the facility uh, in person. Uh, we would call in, uh, you know, often cold, uh, but as the, our marketing engine really fired up, the, the calls became a little warmer. But we would call right into the surgery center over the telephone, uh, ask to find uh, the name, if we didn't know it, of the nurse manager, uh, hopefully catch the nurse manager at the right time. That's really critical to remember that uh, the staffing is much more limited in the surgery center than in a hospital. So if you're catching the uh, nurse manager, you have to be very respectful of their time, uh, even before you start your presentation, and really finding ways that you're going to help them. Uh, we always try to position ourselves as an ally to them, so we know that you know they have very short amount of time to spend on sourcing products. How can we make that easier? How can we deliver quotes quickly? How can we uh, do just-in-time delivery? And as any sale, the follow-up after the sale, uh, making sure that they're satisfied. And that all can be done extremely well using the telephone and then bringing the uh, activity in using inbound marketing. Scott, do you have anything else to add there in terms of uh, med tech companies getting to the end user? Yeah, it's one of the things I would suggest is understanding the stakeholders. Um, and the owners. Um, surgery centers, each of them is an, are individual LLCs um, with individual ownership. And whether you have a hospital partner with physicians with an ASC management company or a private equity with physician, private equity sponsor with physicians, it's understanding who ultimately is sitting at that board making those decisions. And I think far too often um, med tech companies go in sell the clinical benefits um, typically to a younger physician that is, you know, more willing to, ex you know, in, you know, excited about new technology, he or she gets excited about a new device. And, you know, in your CRM, you have a 90% probability of closing for this new screw um, or this new widget. And, you know, a month or two goes by and, and sales executives kind of, you know, say, hey, what's going on here at this center? And when you dissect it, you realize that the targeted physician is not an owner and not an owner in that center. And what I advise clients so often is do that stakeholder mapping um, in your CRM set up with a parent-child relationship. So you understand within Salesforce that if I'm calling on you know, mainline gastroenterology, um, out in Paoli or Paoli Endoscopy Center, um, that is part of AmSurge. AmSurge is owned by KKR. So you understand all the stakeholders in that decision-making process um, as your reps are going into those centers. I love that mapping, really mapping out those stakeholders is like a, a, some great advice there. Um, along those lines, I know you mentioned kind of physicians and, and providers. Wanted to kind of ask Bob Goodman, since since you started saying, you know, you really have a, a sense of physician's role in all of this. So what role do you feel like physicians are playing here? And what are some of the dynamics that might be important for med tech companies and med tech innovators? Right. Uh, I think we should probably talk mostly about physicians who are owners in the centers uh, because physicians who are not owners, they can have some level of influence depending upon what, what their, what the view is of them be potentially becoming owners. Cause you do need a succession plan. You do need to replace all, all older owners as they're, they're retiring and, and that sort of thing. But that being said, the focus should be on definitely on owner physicians uh, specifically ones that ha that play a play a uh, role may sit on the board of the surgery center uh, may be the medical director of the surgery center uh, and and are and are tend to be big users uh, those are the ones that get listened to you know as is true in most situations certainly true with physicians they're not shy people uh, and and uh, you know if they think that there's something that's really good out there they'll they'll go to bat for it if you give them the, the right tools, if you've got 
the right equipment that meets their 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 needs from a clinical standpoint, meets the needs of their patients, and does it well. Uh, if you if it's priced right, and if and 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 or if it's financed correctly uh, from their perspective, because financing plays a big role uh, at times uh, in in these in these uh, in these situations, especially for established centers that are you know a, a capex budget for next year of whatever the number is doesn't matter how how that gets managed and so i think uh uh i think i think it was robert perhaps that mentioned the uh you know uh, per use or maybe it was mark uh the the per use approach uh those things can be really helpful especially if there's no capital outlay so yeah, having things hit, hit the uh hit that operating line is helpful I, I, I think you're just very quickly your point about medical directors um each surgery center when they're doing their certificate of need if it is a con state or as they're forming has a an appointed medical director and usually with a quick google search you can find out who that person is that is a key key stakeholder um, if you're talking about introducing a new procedure into a surgery center or you know what they're accredited to do but it's also a key board member. Um, that medical director is responsible for the care delivery at his or her ambulatory center. And um, I, I think far too often med tech clients don't understand who that person is or don't have any knowledge of, of that medical. So I wanted to take this uh, chance to sort of remind the audience that we welcome questions from the chat. So for, feel free to engage the chat if there's any questions that you might have for our panelists. Um, I kind of wanted to open it up a little bit here with our panelists and say, you know, is there anything that we might be leaving out so far in our discussion that really should be addressed today? So open that up, kind of anybody that might want to provide some some other additional information here. Looks like. Sure. Yeah. A couple of things just following up on um, Scott and Bob's last comment. One is understanding that uh, oftentimes that medical director might not be the physician that may or may not use your product. Uh, sometimes in particular, sometimes the busier productive, whether it's a GI or orthopedic surgeon, aren't the, the medical director. Sometimes it's the anesthesiologist or someone with perhaps a little more uh, uh, stable work-life balance, if you will. So understanding that decision maker uh, and then really showing your entire portfolio. So if physicians want to use uh, the right thing for their patients without a doubt. They are dynamically driven in the surgery center by different levers. So showing the entire portfolio, letting them know that there could be a more cost-effective way to treat the same patient in a different way, um, and then setting up your uh, selling price. I think it's important to have a Kind of a good, better, best strategy that um, you know you can't have the Lexus uh, at both places for the same price. So having a portfolio that perhaps manages your cogs and your price, uh, and allowing physicians to make you know make choices. Well, great points. Anybody else have things to add, uh, Robert Edelstein? Go ahead. Sure. Yeah, I think it's really important to to make sure that your organization. Um, both the sales and the customer service, the website um, is set up to be extremely responsive uh, to these facilities. So again, you know, uh, making sure that, you know, if it's four o'clock in the afternoon and the nurse manager has two minutes to get something done, which is often the case that they're able to reach a, a knowledgeable person immediately, get their answers and move on. Uh, we did extremely well because, you know, we were inside, we had the customer service, we had uh, most of the answers on our website, and we would respond back to them where the larger companies had a sales rep, that sales rep was on the road hunting whales all day long, and if they, you know, had six voicemails on their phone, at the end of the day, they would leave the surgery centers for their last calls and probably spend the next three days playing phone tag with the nurse manager. So we want a lot of clients just because we were there with the answer. Uh, we got them their, their quotes quickly. And often, since they don't carry a lot of inventory, we could deliver the product within a day or two uh, to the facilities. And that response has really helped drive our business considerably. Bob, did you want to add something? Uh, yeah, I did. Um, you, you, sh you should take advantage of uh, the successes that you've had in other other surgery centers, leverage 
leverage those successes, leverage your relationship with those physicians who have been using your equipment, who have been u- doing procedures that have, have had really quality outcomes. Use them to introduce you into other situations. Um, I think that, you know, networking has has been, you know, for the last 30 years, part of my life. And and uh, I think that's a really key way of of uh, of getting potentially getting some some new opportunities. You know, if Charlie's at a conference and he's talking to Bill and Bill has been using your widget uh, to to uh, quote uh, uh, Scott um, at, at their surgery center, they'll they may have a conversation. And if Bill knows that you would like him to tell people about it you know, hopefully you'll, uh, you know, you'll be able to connect with that other, that other doctor and, and maybe and help with your business. So I think that's another way of doing it. Yeah. Just one, maybe uh, to add on to that point, um, <clears throat> there is a building boom right now that is happening with de novo ambulatory centers, specifically in the cardio cast space and the orthopedic space. And typically an ASC development timeline is, you know, anywhere from 18 months to about 30 months, depending on the state and and the building delays that you have. The financing for the physician partners, the earlier you as a med tech company find out about a de novo and can get in and work with the physician partners or development company, particularly if you're selling expensive equipment. Um, You know, if you look at new orthopedic centers and new cardio cath centers, they have very expensive scanners. And if I'm buying a state-of-the-art scanner from Siemens, that might be a million dollars a room. Um, There is a, if I can get in early and have financing options that help basically with the, you know, the the process of that capital equipment, um, it, it, it becomes very sticky two years later when that center opens versus trying to go in when I when that center first opens and sell them in a new piece of equipment or a new, you know, new device or a new stent, for instance. And the performa or the financing documents that were put together were based on an average selling price that might have been lower um, because that vendor knew about that ambulatory center earlier in that process. So it, it's really understanding these de novos and the de novo cycle and it's all public information you can find out who's applied for certificate of needs in different states um and just speaking to your doctors about it hey you know knowing that cardio cath procedures are moving to ambulatory centers you know talking to your private practice cardiologists um are you guys thinking about building a center if so what's your timeline look like the same for orthopedic go ahead robert yeah, to, just to add on that, um, there is a list, I, I forget what the actual name is, but I could find it if someone needs it, uh, of a new construction report that gets published every month. And that will show you the surgery centers that are um, being built and the progress uh, on the surgery centers. And also, uh, we partnered with the equipment planners uh, that often the, the facilities will hire to uh, manage the procurement of all the equipment and getting relationships with those uh, key equipment planners is, is obviously a great thing. So we have, we're a little bit ahead of schedule here. So I wanted to kind of circle back on a, a question um, that we were prepared when we were preparing for this panel. Um, we discussed kind of a distinction between these, the ambulatory surgery centers, hospital owned ambulatory surgery centers, and then hospital owned outpatient facilities. So can you guys lend some insight here into some of those distinctions and how we might uh, consider selling into those various markets? Scott, you were shaking your head. Do you mind sharing a little bit? Um, yeah. And, and then and then there's other uh, classifications. OBLs, um, our office-based labs, um, are also examples of, um, you know, they, they may look and feel like a surgery center, but they may have an OBL classification. Um, you know, taking a step back and understanding um, the state that you're focused on. Um, for instance, there are some states like Virginia that, you know, only has maybe a half dozen ambulatory surgery centers, but you walk around or, or you walk around Charlottesville or Richmond 
and you see ambulatory surgery centers everywhere, um, they're not classified as ambulatory surgery centers. So I think that's an important distinction of, you know, the state that you're operating in um, or, or your, your sales reps are operating in and understanding, you know, what the environment is there for, for ambulatory surgery centers. You also have, um, you, you brought up the point about hospitals uh, with, as owners, and I think probably the panel can attest to this, is the best run ambulatory surgery centers typically have hospitals as a silent partner or hospitals removed as a partner. Um, hospitals readily admit that they are not good at um, managing and running surgery centers. Um, and in, even though they have, like Virtua has a network of ambulatory centers, they're an investor. Um, and they're partnering with either ASC management companies like the AM searches of the world, or they're partnering um, just with, with the physician partners. Um, very few hospitals do ambulatory centers well. Um, so, you know, if, if you have wholly owned hospital ASCs, like for instance, uh, north of us, if you look at the partner system with Brigham and Mass General, they have wholly owned ASCs, the Mayo Clinic as well. Um, the Cleveland Clinic, they, they tend not, to, they tend to be run like a hospital and not like ambulatory centers. So I think it, it just goes back to that stakeholder mapping and understanding the owners, what the state that you're operating in and what the structure is, if you can get at the ownership structure. And these are private businesses. So this is not necessarily in the public domain, just asking questions of your position, um, you know, the physicians that you're calling on, hey, who owns this center? Um, I heard about a new orthopedic center that's opening up in Haverford. Um, do you know who the owners are, or who the investors are? And you can typically get a lot of information just by asking questions. Great, thank you. So we did have a, a great question come in to, into the comments. So wanted to um, moderate that here and open it up for, to any of the panelists for answering this. So how is the buying process different in ASCs? Is there an equivalent of a value analysis committee like we see at hospitals? Um, is it more hierarchical? Maybe the CFO is kind of driving some of those decisions. Can you lend insight there? Uh, yeah, I can take a look at that one. We can pass it on to the team. I mean, typically it is faster. Um, there are uh, on capital, they're still uh, run on an annual budgeting capital process, but sometimes there's um, kind of a minimum that'll slide uh, underneath of it. Uh, but I would say at least monthly, most surgery centers are meeting to talk about a new product committee. And, and again, it varies wildly. So uh, there are situations where, um, you know, some surgery centers have a, a fairly low bar to get a new product into their system. And a rep can actually come in tomorrow and have a bill only form and, and get it paid for. Uh, but if you want to kind of penetrate at a deeper level, um, you're going to need to understand their, their, their processes. But again, most of them within a month, if the physician wants the product and it makes financial sense, you can get it on, on the calendar. Whereas most hospitals have really, particularly after COVID, have put in some pretty significant barriers and even mandates around no new technology until XYZ. So there's certainly more, uh, more barriers in, in a hospital setting. Scott, did you have something to add there? Yeah, the, the other thing, and, and Mark touched on it, um, budget cycles. And um, the if you get to the surgery partners of the world, the USPIs of the world, and, and um, AM surges and the larger ASC management companies, they all operate under fiscal year budgets. And um, the regional VPs that oversee maybe a region of USPIs or surgery partners um, centers um, is fiscally responsible for the operating budgets. Um, so one of the things, the important considerations is if you have a new piece of capital equipment, for instance, um, you're either creating finance terms or bridge to budget programs to get that technology in on an off budget cycle. The other thing is making sure that your new product or device is included in that new budgeting cycle. So for instance, if they're under a fiscal year budgeting cycle, you're working with that regional VP from AmSurge or surgery partners in August to make sure that this new technology is incorporated into their operating budget um, for that next fiscal year. And it's just, it's understanding, 
you know, the constraints that they're under for, from an operating budget standpoint and, and planning for that in your pipeline. Um, you know, I know, you know, Mark, you're, you're, you're dealing with this every day is, um, you know, how, how do you and your CRM plan for the close rate on surgery centers? And so much has to do when they have new operating budgets. Yeah, I think it was a good point uh, around understanding, you know, the earlier you, if you're selling capital, uh, if you can get involved really early, you can get creative, you can kind of talk to decision makers. Uh, it's a great idea. Bob, did you have something you would like to add? Uh, yeah, I, the, the, uh, what everyone said about it, it being a much faster cycle, that's true. Uh, it, there also can be a lot more flexibility as well. Uh, for argument's sake, maybe, you know, the group is out doing physician recruitment and uh, they've decided that they want to take a look at bringing uh, invasive cardiologists into the mix that weren't there before. And so there's a whole new equipment uh, that's required. If it's if it's done off cycle, um, it can still be done. Uh, you know, it's not as rigid at times anyway, uh, as it might be in a hospital environment. And so it's it's you, you can still make it happen. If you're if you're dealing with the you know with the right people uh, at the uh, at the surgery center, Robert, did you have something to add? Yeah, I'm, I'm having some connection issues. Sorry. Yeah, I, we always found that it, that the uh, managers would look at an ROI and uh, back to my eighty twenty surgeon is a, a high volume and bringing in a, a good amount of the revenue for the facility uh, they will often accommodate uh, most of their requests so you know they're very focused on looking at dollars and cents and who's uh, bringing in the revenue and if you can target uh, those procedures and those doctors you're having a much better chance of selling into that facility Okay, so this has been a, a really great discussion. I, I, before we go into the breakouts and have uh, more of a chance to connect with the panelists one-on-one, -on -one, I, I sort of wanted to close um, asking some advice or kind of like a rapid-fire advice from a panelist. And so the, the question I'll ask here is if there's one piece of advice that you can give to med tech innovators and companies that are trying to tap into the ASC market, what would it be? Um, and you could be a repeat of what you've done just to re what you've discussed already to reinforce some of the things that we've learned, uh, but just kind of going uh, along each of the panelists. And I'm going to start with Mark. Sure. I'd say uh, reiterate the fact that do not blend their feedback in with your broader, um, uh, make that a certain segment of your information because it will be specific and understand your product mix. And it could be that your product doesn't make sense for that customer, or you have to change um, your product or your pricing. So again, just look at them as, as unique, as a totally separate, almost look at them as a different country. You know, if you were interviewing, uh, you know, the Japan market versus Brazil, uh, the US surgery center market is its own, own lens. Great, how about Scott? Um, Develop along to add to Mark's point from those findings, whether it's a focus group or survey activity, um, one of the key tools that is incredibly powerful right now is definitive healthcare um, for for the audience that hasn't had experience with this platform. Um, it, it's it's incredible the information that resides in their database and querying definitive healthcare to really fish. Think of it as a fish finder almost um, where the procedure volume is and who's doing the procedures. Um, but more importantly, to develop a strategy, you know, not to have a buckshot approach that your hospital rep in a particular region is also gonna focus on the surgery center. Um, and I think more too many med tech companies assume that within a geography um, that, you know, Philadelphia area, my, my rep that's calling on Penn and Jefferson is also gonna be calling on all the surgery centers, you know, in the five counties. Um, typically they don't. Okay, Bob, how about you? One piece of advice for our audience on uh, that are trying to tap into the ASC market. Uh, I, the, to me, the main thing is uh, connecting with physicians as best you can. 
uh, who are out there, young, whether it's younger ones that are looking to get involved in surgery centers or, or, or some of the existing ones. Um, it, just get to, get to know as many of them as, as you can, because sooner or later, surgeons are going to move to the, to the outpatient side. Um, with respect, and, and this is, this is in the world of private right. practice medicine. This is not in the, in the academic institutions like, like Penn Medicine for the most part. Although Penn Medicine does have some surgery centers, some of it because of the acquisitions that they've, they've made, uh, over the last number of years. Um, but, uh, again, I, I think a key to uh, many respects, key to uh, surgery center opportunities is, is through the doctors. Okay, and I think we were having some connectivity issues, so I don't think, think Rob, we might have lost Robert Edelstein. Uh, so if he comes back, we'll, we'll have him give his final advice. Um, so uh, just want to really thank the panelists for their insights and contributions here. You know, I, I know I learned a tremendous amount, and I know our, our audience did as well. Um, and so what's going to be happening now is we're going to have the opportunity to go into breakouts with our panelists. And so I'll share a little bit about what the topics of those breakouts will be, and then we'll have the chance to um, to the audience will have the chance to, to jump into those breakouts with our panelists. So Bob Gooden is going to have a breakout on physicians and their role in ASCs. Uh, Robert Edelstein is going to have um, a, a breakout on selling into ASCs. Uh, Scott is going to be discussing ASC management companies and the influence of private equity. Um, and then Mark is going to have a breakout on product development for ASCs. So that, that's going to be the plan. So from the PACT group, I don't know if there's any further instructions we might um, need to provide here for our, our group. Okay. Actually, I see Robert, you're back. Sorry. It's intermittent. Um, I want to thank all of our panelists, um, as well as Katie for moderating today, representing our sponsor, the Penn Center for Innovation, as well as our other sponsors, Baker Tilly, Fox Rothschild, and Dwayne Riss for participation here this morning for all of you. Um, yeah, but again, the insights uh, gathered here today, um, and hopefully that it can be applied to your practices, is what we're all about. So if we can be helpful in making those connections, please seek us out online. Uh, we just relaunched our website, uh, PAC, PhiladelphiaPAC.com, and uh, we encourage you to join us on in social channels, uh, whether you spend your time on LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, Instagram, or others. With that, I close it out, give you the rest of your morning and day, and uh, uh, best of wishes in all your efforts in the med tech space, and thank you for letting us play a small role in helping to educate. Have a great day.